You know, I was wondering when that time was going to come when I forgot to turn this thing off. And, uh, and I think the timing issues and all that kind of stuff we may have had starting off were probably because of me. Uh, so I apologize. Uh, I don't know if y'all know this, but uh, we're going to be in the book of Acts today. The good thing is, well, I say the good thing. I, 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 it's sort of bittersweet. We are, we just completed our study within a study in chapter 7 on our good friend Stephen. A lot of lessons learned in that story, in that scripture, in that testimony of a young man of a recent convert to Christianity, of a gentleman that was not a native-born Jew overcoming the obstacle of being an outsider to Judaism and then overcoming being an outsider to Judaism but putting himself back as an outsider as a Christian. And making himself available to be used by the Holy Spirit so much so, so much so that after his proclamation, God called him home. We can look at it as a worldly standpoint, and they can sit, we can sit there and say, well, the world negated his voice. The world eliminated a vessel of the Holy Spirit. But no. God had one purpose for this young man. And He fulfilled it to the T. And God called him home. The beauty of Acts is it doesn't stop there. It continues on because as we are going to start our study in verse 8, or chapter 8 today, we're going to understand or come to the comprehension that God is moving the chess pieces on this board without them knowing it, without them having all the details, without them being refined without them being fully sanctified as we would call it today he uses us the way he created us flaws and all to do his bidding and I love that it gives me so much hope because like I told you last week I look at other pastors I look at other church communities and church bodies and I'm like man I'm not living it up I'm not fitting the bill I'm not making the mark But that's not what God created me to be. So don't ever find yourself, because I, I fully believe that that is a tool of Satan within the body of God's people to say, guess what? You are not this person, so therefore you're not worthy. You're not usable by God. You're not, you don't, you're not equipped. Because I'm going to tell you, when you say, Lord, I'm yours, send me, or here I am, send me. That gives the Holy Spirit all the room He needs to work in you. And when you're fully equipped by the Holy Spirit, there's nothing that can be added on. Nothing. You are fully equipped. So we're going to see some more of those because this wasn't, Stephen wasn't an army of one. God had people already lined up to continue His work. And as we'll see here in just a bit, He had the worst of the worst lined up to do His bidding as well. And He didn't even realize it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, Lord, we thank You so much for this day. We thank You for the opportunity to freely, with liberty, be in Your Word today. 
Lord, we thank you for those who have fought and so valiantly and have laid down their lives so that we could have this freedom. Lord, please let us not take that for granted. Please let it, that sun not set on our watch. Strengthen us and embolden us by your truth today and by your Holy Spirit that we may march on under the banner of Christ Jesus. Amen. So again, we are in chapter 8, starting in verse 1. And I would like to say, I've, I've, I'm trying to learn that there's not a verse that we're going to get to. We're just going to go until, oh, she's not in here. Miss Shirley gives, or now my wife is incorporating that. When you hear somebody clearing their throat, then we know uh, the altar call is coming close. <laughs> I have to be reined in from time to time. And I, I'm sorry. Uh, well, no, I'm not sorry. I get excited when I'm in God's Word. Uh, because it's, it's hard to stop. It's, it's a cliffhanger. But in chapter 8, starting in verse 1, it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. These, these chapter breaks and these verses, you've got to understand, man put, put these in. Sometimes they fit perfectly, sometimes not so much. But this essentially ties us in to the stoning death of Stephen that we studied last week. And now it is, in this chapter, I think a little untimely as far as the way it is separated. Uh, but Saul was in full understanding of what was taking place. Saul was not only consenting but I fully believe by what we saw in the verses prior that he was the initiator, the instigator of Stephen's death. Otherwise, they would have not laid their belongings before him. One of the studies that John MacArthur, uh, as I read some of his works, he basically said that they were stripping themselves down of their clothes so they could throw the stones harder. So they could free their actions and their movements up to grab a bigger stone. Man, that's hard to that is hard to comprehend. And all because they were confronted with the truth of God. And what is so bizarre about that, that they didn't quail God. They didn't stop Him. They didn't even press pause on His activities. They just took out a vessel in which God utilized to convey His truth. And because where they were in their lives, in their sin, they chose to stop Stephen. But guys, it's just not the Sanhedrin here that does that. We, even under the title of Christian, do this all the time. What have we quelled? What have we tried to put a stop to because it made us uncomfortable? Because it wasn't the easy path. Just something to chew on there. And in conjunction with this first sentence, it says, At that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. One of the things you'll hear me time and time again say is that we are doomed, and, I, and this is not me that came up with this, uh, I think 
there's multiple entities that are credited with this quote. Uh, I think the most recent version of that would uh, would be during World War II with Mr. Winston Churchill. Those who do not learn from their past are doomed to repeat it. And to prevent us from doing that as we move forward, let's look back. If you go to Acts, just a few pages over, Acts 1, verse 8. It says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. We can check that off. We've seen that. And in all Judea, we can check that off. We've seen that. And Samaria, there's where we are today, guys. We're starting that section. And to the end of the earth. Remember that chapter 1, verse 8 is our summary. It is our outline of what we are to glean from the book of Acts. We have seen them in the upper room be endowed with the Holy Spirit. We have seen the works of the Spirit whenever Peter and the disciples spoke and he gave one of his, the, his first of his great sermons and 3,000 came to know Christ Jesus. And then not long after that, we see 5,000 in the midst of one of these Holy Spirit-driven sermons. So we see within the initiation of the church, we see it exploding. Growing to the point I believe today in any given church, I don't care what size it is, we would be overwhelmed. But you never at any point in time hear them say, well, what are we going to do about this? Never. Never does it say, hey, man, I think we're going to run out of water here. Man, we got to shut this down at 530. We can't baptize all these people. No. Because there's a difference when you live in your own strength and whenever you submit yourself unto the power of the Holy Spirit. He will, again, give you every aspect of everything you will ever dream of needing when you are in His service. And that's why you never see any belly aching about, man, I think I tore my rotator cuff lifting all these guys out of the water. Man, my back... Peter, you got a Dones? No, you don't see that. They are just in that anticipation I was talking about as we started. They are like, well, come on. If we got 3,000, we got 5,000. And doing my math, where's the 7,000? Where's the day that's coming? They are anticipating the work of the Holy Spirit in this early church. The only thing that you see them do is say, hey, let's develop some helpers. And what do we get out of that? We've got deacons. And we didn't get just any deacons. But as we saw, Stephen was a deacon. But Stephen was endowed with the same sign gifts as the apostles. That's amazing. And as we continue this, we're going to see... I mean, I'm Peter. We're going to see Philip, another deacon, not the apostle Philip. This is the deacon Philip. And one of the things, well, we'll, we'll, we'll grab that in just a second. But, man, this guy, mm, if Stephen was an amazing testimony, wait till you see Philip. So we see... Now that this persecution, and I'm going to say this persecution in the name and banner of Saul. Because he is the only initiator that is mentioned. Yes, he goes to 
the temple and he gets letters to bring this persecution out past Jerusalem. But it's not those guys in the nice, tidy, clean robes and the like that are the ones making all the hubbub. It's Saul. One of the things I will say about him that I find so amazing, it didn't matter if Saul was working on the side of Satan or if Saul was working on the side of God. He was all in. He didn't cut corners. His tenacity was the same. And my, might I say, because God made him that way. One of the things that we will come to find out, because we know that Saul was one of the most educated men, especially when, it's, uh, when we look at the people that made up the New Testament, the characters that God used throughout the New Testament, Paul was probably the most educated man of them all. One of the things that hits me in the gut all the time. Knowing God or knowing of God is not the same as being in a relationship with God. You can have all the head knowledge that you want about the creator of this universe and be so, so, so far from salvation. We're going to see that play out very soon in the passages, passages that come. One of the words, the New King James Version says, we're all scattered throughout. And I'm going to tear this word, this Greek word up with my Keith Phil redneck <laughs> lingo. Diaspero. Diaspora is some of the, one of the things you'll hear people say from time to time. But di diaspero. And I want you to picture this in your mind because we are in, in this part of God's Word. We, they are an agricultural community. And so this Word, as they were all scattered throughout because of this persecution. So again, God is utilizing Saul and his minions to persecute the church and they are driven out which gives us the second venue in our outline as to what God or what God's people are going to do, where they're going to go, where they're going to proclaim his name. So as we look at this word, this diaspora, it alludes to sowing of seed. Now they didn't have the fancy one you ride behind. Well, I say fancy. That's not even fancy nowadays. But the, you come behind and it puts a seed down in the ground at every such and such interval and then covers it back up. The only thing they could do was bust the ground up as best they could and scatter seed by hand. And it went everywhere. With wheat being their main product, or their main crop, you really don't have to have rows, you know. But God is scattering His people to and fro so that His Word will take root and wherever His people are found. Isn't that beautiful? Because one of the things that you'll see, us included, myself more so than any, when I am assuming that I am doing God's work, when I am assuming that I have reached that calling that God has set me to is when I need to be pried up. Because hmm. the other thing that you'll hear me say from time to time, God's church is not this address on Keithville, Kingston Road. It is comprised of the people that are within these pews. If this house burns down tomorrow, guess what? We're still coming to church next Sunday. Let me get a little more serious. 
Church should be, still be happening tomorrow on Monday with God's people. We are the temple in which the Holy Spirit re resides within. So given that information, they would have probably been just as fine just sitting there in Jerusalem. Even though we've got a few people getting killed here and there. Ah, this is comfortable. This is our home. This is, we know the language. We know the people. We know the customs. Let's, this is just comfortable. Let's stay here and keep doing this. That's not what God told them in 1.8. But if you notice at the end of that, that they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And I like this. I, lo I love this even though it doesn't go into great detail. Their calling was not the same as some of these new converts to Christianity. Their calling was to establish the church. Their calling was to found a set of believers to be cast out into these various regions. And they were devout to that. They were, they were serious about that calling. Even though they knew, and that most wanted list that was getting tacked up, those, those guys were on there. Probably Peter, right at the top of it. Verse 2 says, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Let me help make sense of this right here because we don't want to we don't want to just gloss over the truth that's in this verse. It doesn't say devout Christians. It didn't say followers of the way. It doesn't say that the apostles with the help of others carried Stephen to his burial. Because what you'll also notice in the onset of, of Acts, these devout men and their families and their households had come to Jerusalem to take part in Passover. To take part in the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And some, as we see here, have even stayed those additional days and took part Goodness, guys, I'm just... They saw God work. They saw their Creator manifest Himself in so many various ways in these short seasons of these feasts that they were like, I'm not going anywhere. That anticipation we talked about just a little while ago as we started this off. Do you think that these people, even though they haven't given their life to Christ yet, these Jews that have come from every nation to take part in these festivals, the, the first one was the only one that they were, it was demanded of them to be there. You're going to, if you're healthy and you're able, you're going to be there for Passover. And God continued to manifest Himself from Passover all the way to Pentecost. And they have seen this and they're like, I'm not, I don't care if my business is folding up back home. My family made this journey with me. I don't care if I've got slaves that are back there twiddling their thumbs because they don't have their orders for the next thing that they're supposed to do. Matter of fact, I'm going to write them a letter. You're free, guys. 
you're done. I am seeing something that I cannot pull myself away from. When you get before the throne of God in worship, in prayer, or being in God's Word, why in the world would you put a time limit on that? As we've seen in these various outbreaks of revival throughout our nation, I want you to stop and consider one thing. What age group do you see participating in that? Young people. Because you know what? They have not loaded their shoulders with the burdens of this world yet. They have not fallen in to the facade of what is expected that Satan has put out there with those that are lost and with, his, with God's church. That we have somehow flipped the script to say that because I've got to drive this car, because I've got to live in this house, because I've got to be within this community, when I, I've got to wear these clothes, Satan is just like, I don't even have to fool with him anymore. They are so blinded to the reality of what God has for them because I have consumed their time and their passion and their energy with the nonsense of this world that will burn up that I don't even have to fool with them anymore. Myself included, guys. Because I'm going to tell you one of the things that fueled that, that valley that I told you guys about earlier, that valley that I was in, was the worry and anxiety of work. The worry and anxiety of something that has no eternal value whatsoever. And you're like, well, Coy, you, you're on staff at Calvary. How can you say that as you know eternal value? Because that old saying, the devil is in the details. Because I'm so worried about this being right, this being right, this being ready and all that kind of stuff that I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm going to do this in my strength and I'm not going to rely on you. Whoa. Whoa. I might as well build an altar to myself because that's the person that I am at that point in time honoring and obliging. I put God back here. So the things that I've done, the same things that I've allowed my mind to focus on and worry about have now become an idol. And I've just taken God off of His pedestal, off of His throne, and put something so worthless in its place. But these devout men that we're seeing here, they didn't. Even though they're like, well, I don't fully understand this Christianity thing. I'm trying to get my mind around the death, burial, and resurrection of what is claimed to be the Messiah, Jesus Christ. In the meantime, I surely don't align myself with what I just saw happen to this young man for speaking God's truth. And they said, this man deserves better. One of the things you'll find from Jewish history is that if someone is condemned to death under Judaic law, he is in his rights to be buried. But don't you dare lament. Don't you dare shed a tear in public for the mourning of that person. Because then, the judgment goes on you. You are to pay a penalty. Look what it says for these devout men in the second part of that verse. And made 
great lamentation over him. They just heard God's word proclaimed probably stronger than it ever had been in their lifetimes and watched a man die for it. That's something to mourn about. And they said, laws be you know what. This guy is worthy to be mourned over. Number three, chapter, or verse three, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. My goodness. That word havoc, there's various adaptations uh, throughout the, the various types of scripture. But that word havoc in its Greek form is only used this one time in the Bible. I tried the first one, the, 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 the first word in Greek. I can't even begin to pronounce this one. However, we have to look to outside biblical sources to understand what this word even means in its context. And basically what it is uh, alluded to is a wild boar dis destroying, utterly destroy, destroying a vineyard. I don't know about you guys, if you've ever seen uh, what a wild hog will do in the soil and vegetation around this area, man, you would have thought a John Deere tractor with a tiller implement would have come through there. It turns it upside down. And that is what this word, havoc, of the church means. He left no stone unturned. He was tearing it apart piece by piece. And he didn't care. He didn't care what your race, nationality, gender, any of that was. Goodness gracious. But here's the beauty of it. From just verse 3, you can understand why God's people are saying, well, this has been fun. It's time to roll. But the thing that you may not understand or have a full glimpse of is where they go. Samaria is the next on that list of where, you're, where these, this early church is supposed to take God's word. And that's not a good bond right there. The Samaritans were a half-breed Jew, if, if you know, for lack of a better term. They set up their temple on Mount Gerizim. And they adopted the native cultures and religions in the land of Canaan and interm intermingled and married and like I said all that belief systems were intertwined so much so to the point you couldn't unravel it to make a distinction between what is of God and what is not I think you may recall the event where Jesus goes to the Samaritan woman at the well. Those apostles weren't too happy about that trip, if you recall. People would actually go around in a journey around Samaria three days, three additional travel days, and we're not talking about the uh, opportunity to stop in at Best Western or Holiday Inn or whatever. You know, this was your head on a rock, sand where it don't even need to be. They, all, uh, they, three days of that, just so they wouldn't go through the land of Samaria. Yet, 
That's where God's Word is to go next. Verse 4, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the Word. Not with this. They didn't have this compiled. I've told you before, they had the Old Testament and most people only had fragments of that scribbled onto shards of pottery. If they were literate enough to do that. If you were really big time, you may have a scroll of part of those works. So the word that they have was what they heard. And they held on to it so tightly that the Holy Spirit could read, I hate to say this word, could regurgitate it at a moment's notice. They, like an old bulldog, they chomped down and they, were, they weren't letting go. And I've actually had the opportunity to see this in Ethiopia when I had the privilege of being there where people could literally recite word for word chapters, not verses, chapters out of God's Word. And I'm like, how is this even possible? But we see it taking place right here because they are preaching that. And that word preaching is where we first see, and I'm not going to do uh, the Greek in that, but it's basically becoming an evangelist. They are evangelizing. So much so that in verse 5 here, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Philip is the very first person that we'll see later in the book of Acts where he is called Philip the Evangelizer. No other person in God's Word has that denotation as part of their title except Philip. And we'll see why as we go on. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was a great joy in that city. Just to bring this to today, again, this Philip is not one of the apostles. He is a deacon. Yet you see what the Holy Spirit is doing through him. These unclean spirits and the fact that the, the, the fact that Luke puts in here crying with a loud voice. I mean, if you've got a stronghold built and somebody uproots you from that, you're not going to do it without kicking and screaming and throwing a fit. These demons possessing these people would have never thought that they would ever been run out of those that they had consumed. The ones that they had defiled and were in the process of destroying. The, they were, the, their only thought is, Man, who is the next person that I'm going to bring myself within and interrupt their life and destroy their life once I put this one in the ground? But notice in verse 8, and there was a great joy in that city once Philip brought God's word and cast out all that Satan had done within that land. Now I want you to take that so far as to comprehend 
that what would Shreveport, what would Keithville, what would Shreveport, what would Bossier, what would Stonewall look like if God's people got off of their rear ends and in the power of the Holy Spirit went out and cleaned house? What would our government look like? There is nothing that we are going to do in and of ourselves when we are, we are at the will and whim of our local, state, and federal government. The only thing that that government does today is take. Take, take, take. But you say, no, 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 I see I'm giving this, I'm giving that, I'm giving this. But you have to take first in order to give. And the entire time that they are doing that, they are not doing what they are supposed to be doing, protecting our sovereignty and our borders. That's it. That's all this nation was established to do. Protect the rights of its members, of its people. Protect the sovereignty of the nation as a whole. And that is the last thing on their list. Matter of fact, I don't even think it's on their list. But taking has ramped up to the nth degree. When God's people rise up and clean house and stand for what is of God and not of man, you will see not only revival spark, but joy, just like we see here in Samaria. And you're like, Coy, that's mighty harsh. Well, like we learned in Sunday school this morning, God's Word, God's truth, is like that two-edged sword. It cuts, it divides, it splits to the marrow. There's nothing, there's nothing easy about what God's Word does. Because as it's cutting, as it's dividing, as it's exposing what is at our core, what is at our root, the only thing we're left to do is make a decision. Now that we see it laid out before us, what do we do with it? And that's where God's church is at today. Now that we know, what do we do with it? And that's what we should be in prayer about in the days ahead. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, Lord, we thank you so much for this day that you've blessed us with. Lord, we thank you for the testimonies of both Stephen and now as we delve into the testimony of Philip. Lord, we see we see what it is that we are to do in your name. Strangely enough, Lord, it's not much. Because the power is in you. All we are to do is proclaim you. In our actions, our deeds, our words. And the, the rest of it we leave into the power of the Holy Spirit. But Lord, I know I live my life as if my lips are super glued together. I lie in your face like Moses did at the burning bush and say, I can't communicate. Yet, we desire change. Yet, we say we want to see you. Lord, there is work for us to do before that great trumpet sounds. Lord, I pray that your spirit would fall upon us 
and give us the same boldness that we see at the onset of this book of Acts. That no matter what the outcome, we will proclaim you. We will stand for you. Those that may be here today, Lord, that may not know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that your Holy Spirit would prick their hearts and draw them to you. And Lord, for us that sit here and have claimed you as our Lord and Savior, and we know that we are washed in the blood of the Lamb, Lord, I pray that you would light a fire within us. That we would feel uncomfortable when we do not share you with others. That it would burden us greatly that we do not proclaim the name of Christ Jesus into all who we come in contact with. Lord, as we take this moment before your throne, if there be one here that needs to come down, that needs to know you as their Lord and Savior. I pray they would come. If there's those here that may need to come to this altar and surrender something that is holding them back from serving you fully, Lord, I pray they would come. May all that is done Bring glory into the name of God. In the name of Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen.